think it looks oh, something like that. <laughs> That's right. What I've done is I regard that first picture as a master. Mm -hmm. and I call up copy of it, and I can manipulate it locally. I can reduce it, magnify it, I can rotate it, and then replace it right there. Mm -hmm. And I can do this several times. This is, of course, very instrumental for repetitive drawings, like circuit diagrams or bridge bays, where we have several repetitive structures. Oh, if you were drawing a circuit diagram, you might have uh, little resistors or transistors or something already drawn and stored away, and you could call up as many of those as you wanted. Right. Now, imagine that when I was doing my design work, I made a mistake in my master. Well, in order to correct that mistake, it would go back, and let's say I don't really want this circular segment to be in here. I erase it. Now I had the problem of making this, these changes to all the occurrences of this copy in my working drawing. This is very tedious nowadays. With pencil and paper, we have to remember where all the changes are. Now you notice, you remember the drawing, that we now have lost our circular arcs. So if the manufacturer, for instance, of some electronic part changed the design somewhere uh, one of these years, you could just automatically change all the drawings in which it appeared. Correct. Well, now I've showed you many of the basic graphical manipulations we have available. Incidentally, I would like to ask you how uh, big this piece of paper that you keep referring to is and how many pieces of paper you have available to you. Ah, well, this scope, which measures about seven inches on the side, if we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window. We can uh, imagine the computer has a fixed sheet of paper behind this window. Its scale is approximately two miles on the side. Two miles? Right. And let's look at that. I can reduce this drawing slightly. And let me call up a copy of that master drawing again. Put it over the center there. Oops. All right. Now I've hit one stop already. That's as small as you can. You're right. looking at the whole piece of paper. So. Correct. Mm -hmm. And let me magnify it now. And now it's magnified so it's practically off the screen. Place another one in there. <laughs> sort of like the picture within a picture within a picture idea. Right, it's real nightmare material. And as it gets come smaller, back. even though the spot sort of disappears, uh, it's really still there, isn't it? Right, the computer has this all memorized in its memory. But most of the things, though, that we live with in this world are, are three-dimensional rather than uh, two-dimensional pictures like that. Is it possible to use the computer in that kind of problem? Yes. We've expanded Ivan Sutherland's program into three dimensions. I have to bring that off the magnetic tape. There, we have that now. Here we have a single three-dimensional object as seen from four separate views. We have a top view, as indicated by the T here, a front view, and a side view. Oh, this is the way a mechanical drawing would be laid out, and I gather the other one is a perspective. Right, with this addition. Uh -huh. We can rotate this pers perspective separately from these three views. You get an idea of what we have here. I begin to rotate it. You see it's rotating by an axis perpendicular, imaginary floor. We have a wireframe object here with no fabric covering. Hence, we see the rearward lines as they come in behind this S, which might be lying in the surface. So but the there is no <laughs> fabric here, so we see everything. When the letters go around behind, they're backwards. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we are drawing much like we are in the two-dimensional, except we're with that is by moving a single point around with a light pen. But we're drawing directly in 3D. Here, I have latched the pen on to the letter S. And as I move this around in the letter S, you see four dots moving in all the four views. This is the projection of the single dot. In the side view, it's actually also following the S, but in the other two, um, you're sort of looking at the S on edge, so it's just moving back and forth. Right, and this is because the S is indeed in the plane of that side surface. So we're seeing the single dot simultaneously in all four views as we're moving directly in three dimensions. You're just tracking in that case. Can you actually draw something in all three dimensions simultaneously? Let's put a rough on this object in this fashion. We'll latch onto that corner, and we'll draw a pyramid. I can, <laughs> I can see it from the side view. It's a false front house there. Right. Right? 
And I can also distort things, move things, like we can in two dimensions. If I latch onto this line here, or let's say this line over here, I can pull that out to the side and distort the object slightly. Now let's see what we've drawn here. We'll rotate the perspective, this view, again. Quite a strange looking object. And now we have a warped house under construction, perhaps. And there's the F backwards in the perspective. Uh, tell me, is it possible to do, uh, other than these um, simple straight line shapes, for instance, curved shapes, uh, could you design something like an automobile this way? We're well underway with surfaces. We've begun the programming there, and we understand them, we think, pretty well. To learn more about the handling of three-dimensional objects in the computer, we met next with Dr. Lawrence Roberts of the staff of the MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Well, you heard Tim Johnson explain how to construct solid objects with lines and uh, wire figures. However, if we want to manipulate solid objects with the computer, we want to be able to represent their surfaces and so on as solid. Now here we have a representation of a uh, piece of wood, perhaps, which is all of the lines of the sections behind each piece are hidden. As you'll see, as I start to rotate this object, the computer will place part of it behind the other part, and you will see that, indeed, the computer has a representation of it, which knows that it's solid. It's no longer just that wire frame. It really is solid, and when a line is behind the front surface, you just don't see it. That's right. It's a and so this is just one of my models that I can work with. I have a few others that I can call up. For instance, a wedge. I'll make the wedge slightly smaller and rotate it a little bit so you can see the oh, yeah. properties of it. Now be fairly basic shapes. Huh? Oh yes. You can construct quite a bit out of these basic shapes. As I move the wedge around in space, you'll see that it goes behind the yeah. solid and through it. And the computer figures out where the lines should appear and where they should Where the intersection is. You get the feeling of three-dimensional space here very dramatically, uh, uh, as though this were a window and was a, a, a fore area and a behind area. Right. Now, as this comes out through the other object, you see that it indeed intersects it and can move right through it. Now, we also have been working with the flow charting of programs. To instruct a computer what to do, you need to write a program. A flow chart then would be sort of a diagram of the steps that you'd want the computer to take in solving some particular problem? Yes, in fact, I have a flow chart on here. This is with Sketchpad and again, and we have a demonstration of boxes representing statements to the computer to do some operation and compare some numbers and make a test and transfer one way or the other. This is the way the human being would like to set it up by drawing boxes like this would represent different computations. This is the way that a programmer normally operates, and then he has to transcribe this to some form like cards or something as an input. But here we go directly from him drawing the flowchart and stating what each piece is, putting the statements inside the boxes, to a compiled program, which he may execute on the computer. Well, you've shown us how you can enter numbers, say, by a typewriter, and now we can draw things for the computer uh, directly. Are there other ways that we'd like to be able to communicate with the computer? Well, we've been investigating here at the lab speech recognition and handwriting recognition for enabling the person to communicate better in those ways with the computer. There are a lot of techniques which would be very useful when combined into a whole. And all of these techniques, including the graphical manipulation, will make it much easier in the future for the man to dynamically converse with a computer. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Today, we've been visiting the MIT Lincoln Laboratory to learn about the computer sketch pad. Our guests have been Professor Stephen Coons, Mr. Timothy Johnson, and Dr. Lawrence Roberts. I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter.